I think this is the uh, the post lunch sort of low potentially. So we'll uh, we'll get started. We are we're we're going to pick up on a uh, a theme that we were talking about this morning, connecting uh, more people around the world to the internet um, with our next two guests, who have connected uh, uh, tens of uh, millions of people um, around the world, both in the United States and in the uh, emerging markets. Uh, Evan Marwell is the founder and CEO of Education Superhighway. The organization's mission is to upgrade internet access in every public school cl classroom in America so that every student can take advantage of the promise of digital learning. In its first three years, the organization helped shape President Obama's Connected Initiative and served as a catalyst for modernization of the FCC's $4 billion E-rate program, which helps schools and libraries obtain affordable broadband. These achievements earned Evan the 2015 Visionary of the Year Award from the San Francisco Chronicle. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Eagle is the founder and CEO of JANA, which is currently the largest provider of free internet in emerging markets. JANA's technology has been integrated into the billing systems of over 300 mobile operators that have a coverage area of over 4.5 billion people. In 2015, JANA provided over 30 million people with free ad-supported internet access. In addition to running Jan and Nathan teaches at Harvard and is a technology pioneer at the World Economic Forum. Um, so you guys are both solving big problems. Um, Evan, you're improving connectivity and the internet for 50 million plus uh, K through 12 students in the United States. Evan, you're connecting even more people um, uh, globally. We talked a little bit this morning in a different session about um, the private sector and the public sector and governments and how they work together. Um, even more broadly, I mean, start, talk about the problem that you saw uh, three years ago, when you, or four years ago, when you started the organization um, and how you've worked uh, with the government to, uh, to try to solve that problem. Yeah, great. So uh, four years ago when we got started, um, there were less than five million out of the 50 million kids in America's public schools that actually had enough internet access in their classrooms to, to use technology. And we saw the revolution that was starting to happen in classrooms where teachers had access to enough bandwidth. And so we set out on this mission to connect the next 45 million of those students. Um, but what we realized very quickly was, just like any of the great infrastructure projects in America's history, whether it was the Erie Canal or the Transcontinental Railroad or rural electrification, this was not something that the private sector alone was going to accomplish. In fact, you know, we'd ha we've had internet for a really long time, and only 5 million of our kids in 2012 had enough bandwidth in their classroom. So we realized we had to leverage the government and the public sector to actually achieve this goal. And so all of our work has been about really bringing together the public sector and the private sector. The public sector, both on the demand side, the, the schools, they, they had a real lack of expertise, a lack of knowledge about how to go through these procurements, how much broadband should cost, who they could get it from, aside from their phone company or maybe their cable company that they'd been buying forever. And it was really about connecting them and their needs with the private sector, but with the government bringing the funding to make that happen, especially to make the build out of fiber networks to places that don't have it happen. Because today, you know, fiber, telecom companies, cable companies, they've built fiber networks to probably 70% of the, the population, if you will. Um, but that last 30%, it's really hard for them to make an economic case to build out those networks and make those investments. And, and that's where I think the public sector has a, a really great role to play. On top of that, uh, the public sector can be really helpful in getting to scale in building awareness. Right? So the way that we've managed to connect 20 million kids over the last two years has been largely by partnering with state governments and, ha and taking resources from the federal level, but the relationships that those state governments have with the schools and with the communities to make this all happen. That's great. And so, Nathan, you're uh, also dealing uh, with governance, you're, governments. You're dealing less with fiber, more with mobile operators. Um, talk a little bit how you're going about uh, connecting more people uh, in the emerging markets. Especially. Sure. I, I think there's an interesting analogy uh, between our two models. I mean, um, we have to work with service providers as well. I mean, our, our service providers generally aren't just kind of the, 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 the ISPs of the world, but rather they're the mobile operators. Um, and, uh, and there is inherent cost associated with pro providing connectivity, whether you're providing that connectivity in a school or, or you know, in, a, in a village in Africa. 
Um, and you can't expect these service providers to basically just be rolling over and, and providing that connectivity without, um, without thought to their bottom line. Uh, and so someone needs to be footing the bill here. And for us, it's, it's not about the governments. Uh, the governments are a potential source, um, but what we've found is that advertisers um, are, a, uh, are a potentially m massive uh, you know, group of organizations who are increasingly interested in trying to get mind share of these emerging market consumers. And so um, maybe backing up and talking a little bit about our business, we, we provide free internet to people exclusively in emerging markets. Um, we are uh, we're now become the, the second largest mobile advertising platform in, in India next, next to Google. Um, and uh, we've gotten that way uh, on the backs of advertising. So uh, we provide people with, with free internet and in exchange they, uh, they are exposed to ads. Um, and uh, that model isn't particularly new, right? I mean, just as uh, you know, the PNGs of the world created the soap opera to make uh, broadcast television free, um, we're enabling these big global brands to essentially make broadband mobile internet free in some of the regions where um, people simply can't afford the, the price per megabyte to be able to consume it any other way. So an obvious question um, for you and sort of a, a juxtaposition is uh, internet.org uh, and what Facebook um, is trying to do, I think in a different way in terms of how they uh, enter into some of these countries and, and interact with the, uh, the operators. We'll talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, uh, so, so freebasics.org, um, and they, they are our largest competitor. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, the model is, is fundamentally different. Um, what we do is we essentially put money into someone's prepaid account, money that can be used for, uh, to get access to any kind of content. You know, they, uh, they can get access to Facebook, but they also can get access to Google and to, you know, watch a YouTube video. Um, and we, do, we get that money through advertising. Um, the Facebook model is one where they partner with generally with one carrier per country um, and convince that carrier that um, they should give away Facebook for free. Uh, and, uh, and both models work. I mean, we've, we've been working, um, you know, in, in India before Facebook, they, their, their project kind of got regulated away. We were working hand in hand, and our users found benefit in both both things. I mean, they they would go through Facebook to um, to uh, or free basics to get access to Facebook, but when they wanted to get access to the rest of the internet, they would go through our service. Um, and I think it's telling that we had about five times as many users as as they they peaked out at, um, despite basically launching almost a year after they did in India. Uh, and I think that's indicative of the fact that, uh, you know, the population at large uh, don't just want Facebook, right? The population at large, whether you're in North America or you're, whether you're working in rural Tanzania, they want access to the full internet. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, with our model, we can provide them that. Yeah. So when we were talking a little bit um, earlier in, in, the, in the green room, we were talking about your, your, your two businesses. And um, you know, one, one thing that we kind of brought up was that you both rely, and this may be an obvious point, on the carriers, right? Um, you're using kind of free market principles. You're not um, appealing only to altruism, or mostly not appealing to altruism. Um, but you have to rely on these guys. It would be interesting to talk a little bit about how you interact with them um, and the kind of similarities and, and differences. Evan, I'll start with you. Yeah, so for us, our big message to the carriers is that we are a lead generation channel for them, right? So there's a lot of business out there with schools that they're not doing today. I mean, schools are connected, but they don't have nearly enough broadband, and they don't all have the fiber optic connections that they have. So depending on the carrier, if it's a traditional incumbent LEC or cable company, often the, the discussion is, hey, today you're selling them 100 megabits, they need a gigabit. We're going to help convince them that they need that gigabit, and then we need you to step up and you know, give them a good deal to get to that gigabit. And it turns out sort of the more broadband for your budget message is, is one that works with both the schools, because they don't have huge amounts more money they can spend, but it also works with the carriers because they understand their economics of providing additional, uh, on a wired network at least, providing additional bandwidth. It's pretty, it's pretty easy for them to do that. So, so for us, we're first and foremost a lead gen channel for them. But in addition, you know, I have to say, as I have traveled across America dealing with the biggest carriers and the smallest ones, they want to do the right thing by kids. And so if you can set them up in a way where they can be successful financially and they can also do the right thing for kids, 
it's a winning proposition. It's a win-win for mm. them. That's great. Nathan, is, do you have the same experience? Yeah, I'm, regrettably, our mobile operators um, are less inclined to uh, at least uh, take any kind of sacrifice on behalf of, of kids. Um, uh, but I mean, and, and I think actually this is kind of where perhaps our businesses fundamentally differ. Um, we have to be carrier agnostic. We can't actually go out and just do a tie-in with one operator in a country. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, P&G or Unilever or Coca-Cola or Twitter or Amazon, you know, they don't want to engage with just Tata Docomo subs. They want to engage with every consumer in the country. Uh, and so what that means is that we have to partner and integrate our technology into the back-end billing systems of every single mobile carrier. Um, and uh, in doing so, what that means is that we can't play favorites. Uh, and we have to be kind of at arm's length with, with the mobile operators. And so um, uh, the way we've done that is simply by going out and buying in bulk uh, internet uh, at the, you know, whatever the, uh, the price that they're, they're willing to, uh, to, to sell it to us. And we do that across every mobile operator. And, and to date, um, you know, our tech has been integrated now into the back end billing systems. of We just integrated with our 311th mobile carrier. Um, and uh, that brings us our total up to 4.56 billion prepaid subs um, that we uh, can essentially uh, put money into their accounts, uh, which represents more than half of humanity. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I mean, we're helping the carers do the right thing, but the reason they're doing the right thing is because we're creating competition, right? So a big part of what we're doing is we're saying, we're a lead gen channel, who wants the business? But they're bidding on it, and, and, and creating competition is what's motivating them to do the right thing. Yeah, so. but you both have had incredible success. Um, uh, in, in, in your organizations, Evan, you've created an enormous amount of awareness for this. You've been able to um, garner federal support, billions of dollars, um, to, hit, to help sort of state, state, at the state and local level these public schools upgrade. What, what are some of the biggest challenges you have? I know you have a mission by, I think it's by 2020, to have every K through 12 um, public school uh, upgraded. What, what are, what, what's your biggest challenge as you, as you look ahead to the next two and a half? Yeah, as, as, as we look ahead, our biggest challenge, frankly, is marketing, right? So we um, have got these great programs. We've got 40 governors across the country that have committed to upgrading their schools. We have $4 billion a year of funding from the federal government to make those upgrades happen. And our challenge is, turns out it's hard to sell free to schools, right? So um, our biggest challenge is how do we get those schools to engage with us, to engage with the, the programs that we're running with the governors, uh, so that we can hit our goal of being out of business in 2020. And, and that's really been our plan from the start. By 2020, upgrade every school to the minimum standards, um, 100 kilobits per student, fiber to every school, Wi-Fi in every classroom, and then go out of business. And that has been actually one of the great lessons, unexpected lessons from the work we've done, which is, you know, by having an end target, we have been able to run our organization very differently than most nonprofits. In fact, we run our organization pretty much the same way that any startup runs, you know, who has an end target of an IPO or a sale or, or whatever it is. And it allows us to be milestone driven, it allows, allows us to raise our philanthropy in rounds, it allows us to attract the same kind of people who want to work at, you know, the next startup here in Silicon Valley because they know they'll accomplish something in that period of time. So in a way, our biggest challenge is marketing. But our other biggest challenge is the same set of challenges that any high growth organization has in Silicon Valley. I was thinking about the same question for you, Nathan, and thinking about connecting four and a half billion people and getting them to <laughs> interact with the, uh, even the mobile web. Sure, that but, sounds challenging. But, right. uh, um, I mean, I think we kind of use a similar, similar principle about having a deadline, I mean, or, or perhaps at least a, a stretch goal of, uh, by 2020, getting to a billion people. Um, and we're about a 20th of the way there now. So we're, uh, we're, we're making slow and steady progress. But I think, we, it, we, um, I think it's a tractable goal. And uh, in terms of like the, 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 the biggest challenge that I think uh, prohibits us potentially from hitting, uh, getting, giving a billion people free, free internet <coughs> access, uh, it comes down to advertiser demand. And it comes down essentially to where is the money gonna come from? Right to give a billion people free free connectivity, um, you know, you're talking about tens of billions of dollars um, that you need to uh, that you need to come up with, uh, and um, what that that ultimately means is that we've got to figure out how do you how do you take um, 
what's being spent right now in the developing world on advertising, which is about $200 billion. And you know, how, how do we get about 10%, 20% of that capital um, and redirect it away from the people who own the billboards or the, the radio stations or the television channels and, and, and put, redirect that capital directly into the pockets of the very consumers that these large advertisers are trying to reach. Um, and that's a challenging value proposition, uh, but that's, that's the, that is the big challenge. We have a marketplace, um, but on one side we have people who want free internet, and the other side we have advertisers who want to start engaging with this audience. We're never, you know, in the foreseeable future, ever going to run out of people who want free internet. Uh, so we, we don't have to advertise our products. Um, we, uh, you know, we have basically it seems like an unlimited supply of people who kind of are constantly downloading our app wanting to basically engage more with advertisements so that they can get free connectivity um, and our challenge is like we've we've got to figure out how to source the demand that can um, uh, start enabling you know these next billion people to uh, to get online yeah one other question then we'll open it up to the audience I think in your case it's sort of obvious someone who's not connected becomes connected now all of a sudden they can um, you know, text message or, you know, see sort of basic content and communicate um, on a phone. Evan, I think maybe, maybe in your case, at least for me, it's sort of less obvious. I mean, what's, what's an example of something that a kid in school um, today can't do um, that he or she will be able to do um, as a result of, uh, of, the, of the kind of upgrade that you're, uh, you're working on? So, I mean, there's an incredible number of things that are happening in classrooms because of technology. But the one that I always go, there the are two that I probably point to first. The first is what people talk about as the course equity issue, right? So there's an amazing statistic that came out not too long ago. 40% of America's high schools don't offer physics. 54% don't offer calculus. 75% don't offer computer science. That one was probably a little more expected, but 40% not, and, and the numbers for chemistry are high and, and, and so on and so on. So the first thing that schools are using this for is to give kids access to those courses. And that's how we're leveling the playing field, right? Technology in many ways, and in, in the internet, in education, is about leveling the playing field, making sure every kid has access to the same kinds of educational opportunities. So, so that's one. The second one, which, which I think is ultimately where we'll head, um, which is personalization of learning. But the starting point for that is empowering teachers. And it's giving teachers the data that they need to know who is getting it and who's not. Where do I need to focus my attention? And my favorite example of this was in an eighth grade math class uh, not too long ago. Every kid in the, in the class had an iPad. And they came in and the teacher said, okay, your Go problem is on your, is on your iPad. Do it and submit it to me over the wireless network. And after about a minute and a half, the teacher gets up from the front of the classroom and he starts walking up to some of the kids. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, what's he doing? And I realized that what's going on is he's walking up to the kids who haven't submitted the problem yet. So he knows instantly which kids understood last night's homework and yesterday's lessons and which kids didn't. And more than that, because he's having a chance to talk to them, he's understanding what they didn't understand. So now he, in real time, is adapting what he's going to teach that day. And he starts with a review of the concepts that kids are not getting, and then he can move on to the next set of material, which if the kid didn't understand yesterday's material, they're certainly not going to understand today's material. So those are two examples, but the thing that is so exciting about this is it's, it's, there's a, a thousand flowers or 10,000 flowers or maybe 100,000 flowers blooming out there where teachers are figuring out how they can take technology to make their classrooms more effective. That's great. I know we're running a little bit short on, on time, but we have time for, uh, for one or two questions from the audience. Yeah, grab this. Anything hey, let me grab this. There you go. Thanks. So this question is for Evan. Um, in regards to providing um, broadband connectivity to schools, are there any initiatives that you're doing to also provide um, hardware, which is also a major cost for them? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Thanks. 
Yeah, so there have been some initiatives of uh, companies like Sprint, for instance, has donated a lot of uh, hardware to some schools. Uh, but the reality is, I believe that the market is going to actually take care of this problem. So the market is driving down the cost of devices. We're sub $200 on Chromebooks and things like that already. And the real big opportunity is that America spends $8 billion a year on textbooks. Okay, and so by transitioning that $8 billion a year budget to things like hardware, applications, content, and teacher professional development effectively, I think there's plenty of funding to actually address those kinds of needs. Hello. Um, hi, so I have a couple questions. Um, one is based on your work internationally, both of you, um, and how you are addressing issues of culture and how you've had success in ensuring and how you're thinking about gender issues with respect to culture internationally. Um, and then the other one is domestically, how you are uh, working within indigenous communities and on reservations and what you're doing to make sure that they're not forgotten in terms of being connected. You want to split those one for one, or yeah, yeah. We, we do no business in North America uh, with you know it, with anyone, um, and we do no business in Western Europe either. So we're exclusively in emerging markets. Um, and in terms of localization, I mean it's uh, it's challenging. I mean, we we have operations in over 90 countries, um, and we operate this company out of Boston. And it's difficult to have bring in uh, in-house experts uh, in Filipino culture and in Nigerian culture and, and, and people who are experts on like, how do you engage with the South African consumer? Um, uh, what's striking is across cultures, across continents, uh, there does seem to be kind of one uh, underlying feature that, that uh, seems to unify at least all of these, these groups of our users globally, and that's um, the desire to get free internet access. Um, so, so that's kind of, the, that's our first, uh, you know, we throw lots of stuff against the wall, uh, some things stick, some things don't, but um, there is kind of this, uh, you know, undeniable demand for, for the product that we have. And then it's just a question of like, well, how do we localize it in a way that really resonates? Um, what we found uh, works in a market like Pakistan. Uh, categorically fails across the board when you try to launch that type of feature in a, man in a place like Manila. Um, so uh, we do have to do um, more localization than I thought we would have to. Uh, and, and ultimately what in many instances that means is putting people on the ground uh, and getting exposure and doing these kind of face-to-face -face user interviews. Uh, and uh, and what's, what I find gratifying is that um, to your gender question, um, it is striking how um, you know getting getting access to uh, connectivity without uh, having to incur costs really does resonate with uh, basically underserved uh, uh, demographics uh, in some instances, including including women, uh, where they don't need to take money to be able to communicate with their sister living up country or um, or whatever else that they would like to get the access to the internet for. Um, and what's particularly gratifying from our business model is that. Um, and, and for the, the case of women, those are exactly the types of, cons you know, the, the demographic that are the, some of the largest advertisers in the world are trying to reach. You know, whether we're working with the Hindustan Unilever or PNG, um, it's, uh, it's the women that are, uh, in many instances, making these decisions about what kind of soap to buy for their household. Uh, and so um, we're enabling our advertisers to go out and, and target the demographic that they want, and at the same time, uh, I think, uh, ultimately adding a lot of value on the, the user side. Yeah, in terms of your question on um, tribal communities and things like that, so they're 100% part of our target in terms of getting them upgraded. And we're working with the Bureau of Indian Education as well as uh, tribal leaders uh, across the country to make sure that they're included in these uh, opportunities as well. But in some ways, similar problem that I was talking before, marketing, right? How do we make sure that they respond when given these opportunities to actually do something? Well, I think we're, uh, we're out of time. Thank you both for being here and for, uh, for a great discussion. Thanks.